Hi, I'm Ken Crawford, president of the Alaska Conference, and I want to show you around my Alaska. I love it here. This is not the end of the world, but it's pretty close. I love Alaska. It's the greatest adventure you could ever imagine. If you want to find out more, go to our website, alaskaconference.org, and you'll find all kinds of information and stories on what Alaska is like. There's a constant collision between civilization and nature because we live next to each other. There's a feeling of remoteness. Not isolation, but remoteness. There is a vastness in the wilderness in Alaska. The mountains are more majestic. Nature is undisputed master. There's something about this country that sets off in me a craving for heaven. The living conditions are a challenge, I can tell you. But the needs in Alaska far outweigh the challenges of living here. I'm going to take you to many of these places during this series. You're going to find them so interesting. Each one has its own separate culture. We're so glad you could join us. We're uh, in Alaska telling a few stories of faith of the members and showing some of the beauty of Alaska. We're going to be getting on the Stikine here in a few minutes and going across the bay to Ketchikan. We're currently on Prince of Wales Island. We've been here for a few days and it's been beautiful. And so now we're going to uh, spend a little time going across. So come with us and see where we're heading next. Originally, back in the late 1800s, it was just a village, a small native village. The southernmost church in Alaska and the very first church is Ketchikan. Ketchikan, Alaska, one of the most beautiful cities in the whole state. It lies about 600 miles north of Seattle in its course at sea level. In fact, it's built into the side of the steep mountain that you can see behind me. Many of the, the houses here, in fact, some of the streets and the stores themselves are actually built out over the water on pilings. Some of the sidewalk, the sidewalk and roads here are actually wood. The principal means of income and the principal industry in Ketchikan is actually fishing and has been for the, the better part of a century. It's here that five beautiful runs of salmon come up through these fjords every summer. And all of these boats that you see out here, many of them are fishing boats that uh, go out and fish salmon. In fact, the one you can see coming in there is just coming in from trolling for king salmon this early. The Seventh-day Adventist work started here in Alaska. In the late 1800s, Ada Sparhawk converted to the Seventh-day Adventist faith under the influence of the teachings she heard in Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. In 1899, at Fort Wrangell, Alaska, Ada married James Young. She was only married about five years and her husband James died. And so she continued on here as a widow. Her younger brother, Leif, came to help her and they built a second store. Ada's spacious home above the store was where she met with her brother Leif. They built a small area where they could meet as a church. And for the next 10 years, they met in this area, just the two of them, by 1910, they were up to about 10 people attending in that church. And yet they continued to spread the word here and to do literature evangelism and to grow until the first Seventh-day Adventist church was established here in this town. God used a dream to, to uh, get our Clinton people to join the church. Yechat Yudu Wasak. Kuyukon Klinide De Nach Watsta. My name is uh, Long Way Round Raven, a raven that doesn't apply a straight line. He takes the long way around like an arch or so stops here and there before he gets to the point. My parents were from the first my father was from the first wolf house of Kui Island, and my mother is from the first house of the double headed raven of the Klin A D. And, and back before the first missionaries came to Alaska, we knew there was a trinity. The trinity was uh, the Father, is the Kion Kawu, is the great man up above, or our Heavenly Father, however you wanted to interpret that. His son is Duyetsate. And the tongue twister is the Holy Spirit. 
And it's, his name is longer than the God the Father and the Son put together. It's Hethul Koyukskahegu. means the Holy Spirit. We knew their, their trinity was there before the first missionaries came up. Our people that think it could change or uh, trace their stories back to the great flood of Noah. They have their stories how they went on the high peaks. This is my Aunt Betsy who had the dream that uh, somebody who knew was going to teach us to worship on a different day than Sunday. And this is my mother, uh, Maggie, Maggie James. And this is me right there. My mother would get us around uh, the, the circle and we'd re she'd read the Bible to us. And she'd say, there's something wrong with the church we're going to. There's something wrong there. But she never would elaborate or explain what the reason was because we're just little kids. But when, one day that uh, we were going to church, uh, we went to church on Sunday. We knew that we knew that Sunday was the right day to worship on because that's what the preachers told us. They told us that, so we believed them. But that's where my mother was saying, there's something wrong with what they're saying and what I'm reading here in the scriptures. And so uh, one day that uh, my mother, my mother, uh, my father was on a week on Saturday. It was the day before we went to church on. That uh, uh, he always got up and made pancakes, and that was a big deal for us to have pancakes. And I loved to wash dishes on those days because the syrup was easy to wash off the dishes. <laughs> and of course, I was standing on a chair, and and, and uh, standing on a chair and. Uh, Looking, the, the chair had a window right above the sink and it faces the little uh, town of Craig, the, the down, what we called the downtown back then. And uh, here Aunt Bessie and Uncle Sam Thomas were coming up to uh, the trail. Eventually came on the boardwalk and I said, here comes Aunt Bessie and Uncle Sam. My mother said, I wonder what they're up to. They must either have some good news or some bad news. She says, well, wait and see. But nevertheless, what I did is I ran her a cool glass of water because when Aunt Betsy came in the door, she loved to have her water, loved water. Like my grandfather, he'd, he'd drink a couple of quarts of water without even blinking an eye. But uh, they loved the water. And, and anyways, they came in and sat down. And mother, mother had said, uh, uh, how are you doing? Because we knew they weren't coming for breakfast because we're they came too late, it was too early for supper because we had supper around four or five o'clock. In our culture, when somebody came to your house, it's understood you're gonna feed them. You're gonna feed them. And that was our, our culture, that's the way we were brought up. And uh, here, Aunt Betsy sat down after drink her uh, water and she says, uh, uh, Maggie, that's what everybody called my mother, Maggie, but with her, she was, we couldn't call her that because she was mom to us. She says, I had a dream last night. I had a dream last night. I still can hear the fellow talk to me. I can hear his voice. He says, you people are not going to be able to, not going to be worshiped on Sunday anymore. You're going to be worship on, worshiping on a different day. And I said, not only that, your diet's going to change. You're not going to eat the same things that you're eating now. Of course, back then we used to fry things in lard and eat bacon and other things like that. Of course, when they, she said that, we didn't know what the changes were gonna be. But it's not only that, your drinks are gonna to change too. And back, back when she said you'll be worshiping on a different day, we were wondering what day that was gonna be. Lo and behold, about six, seven months later, Stuart Emery and Elma Emery came up. Elma had an organ that was about so big, it was like an accordion laying on its side, and she, she pumped the pedals and got the air moving, then she started playing the music. And from that, that point on, when my mother said, wait to see when the people showed up, that w there were six families, six families waiting for him to show, because everybody believed in dreams. People that uh, we grew up with are no longer here, because they, had a different lifestyle. A lot of them died early, heart attacks and other things because I think that the bacon and oil they're using, what not, caught up with them. Pray for them. I hope prayerfully that they'll be up there in heaven. 
I want you to meet somebody who came from corporate America to Southeast Alaska and has become a very effective pastor. Hello, my name is Pastor Todd Irvin and I pastor the Ketchikan Alaska Seventh-day Adventist Church and we are located here in Southeast Alaska. I am originally from Flint, Michigan, which is also the birthplace of General Motors. I was born and raised in Flint for 46 years and I was a third generation General Motors employee. Corporate America, True Blue GM. I have been very active in my, my church as the head elder and the resident lay minister of the uh, South Flint Seventh-day Adventist Church and just love working for the Lord. Just love giving Bible studies and leading out in church and, and just being very active. I had received a phone call from It Is Written that a gentleman by the name of Ernie had completed the Discover Bible study series and wanted to meet with a Seventh-day Adventist in the Flint, Michigan area where he resides. And so I took the phone call, took his name, his address, and within two hours I made connection with, connections with him on telephone and made arrangements to visit him. Well, it, it took two years to continue on with some more Bible studies and what he and I would refer to as the back porch religion because we spent a lot of time on his back porch uh, discussing Jesus, discussing those beloved truths of the scriptures and help answering all his questions. While we were having these Bible studies, his home was, was not in a very nice area of Flint, so to speak, a very challenging area crime-wise. And Ernie would always sit out on the back porch, as we all did, with a gun right by his chair and right by the Bible, just to protect us, so to speak, while we're outside having these Bible studies. It was very strange at first, and I was kind of uncomfortable with that gun because I did not know much about Ernie at that time. But got, you know, av having spent a lot of time with him, getting comfortable with that gun next to him, realizing that everything was safe, we had those heavenly angels protecting the, our home anyways, his home anyways, as we, were as we were discussing Jesus and his word. Two years later, he made the decision to be baptized. And he's a man who has lived a very worldly life. And when they say that they have, they have done all and did all, that was Ernie. He was one of those gentlemen. And so he dedicated himself to the Lord Jesus Christ and joined the fellowship of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. You, as a layperson, can easily call, it is written, or voice a prophecy and ask if there's anyone in your area that is interested in taking a Bible study through the Discover Bible School process. I grew up in Flint, Michigan and my dad was a forecast analyzer for General Motors. My story really begins on a very cold January morning and in Michigan it can get very cold and I was walking into work into the GM division that I happened to work at at the time. Uh, the big three, General Motors, Chrysler and Ford, had already been down to Washington uh, begging Congress to loan them money to survive. It was the beginning of the Great Recession. How we came to Alaska was a pretty amazing story. Most of my family, actually almost all my family, is, is associated with General Motors, except for we had one black sheep of the family and he worked for Ford Motor Company, but that made for some very good discussions at, at home. Anyways, my story really begins on a very cold January morning, 2009. I was walking into work and I said, Lord, I said, I am feeling called into the ministry full time. But you're going to have to make some, you're going to have to do some big miracles here because I love my job at General Motors. My roots are here in Flint, Michigan. We absolutely love our church family, our family, our friends. I mean, the roots are solid here, very strong Midwestern roots. But Lord, if you're going to ask me or want me to go into the ministry full time, you're going to have to pull the rug right out from underneath me because I'm too weak. I can't do it. But I'm feeling pulled in this direction, big time. I can feel the Holy Spirit working on my heart. And that was my discussion with, with God on that cold January morning. Four months later, on April 20th, I lost my job. They went bankrupt. I was laid off as well as 75,000 other General Motors employees. Well, when that happened, 
I looked up and I said, there's the green light from God. And I said, you really do know how to motivate and get someone's attention. You got my attention. That was the major green light that I needed to go into the ministry. But I was still shell-shocked. I was like, wow. For the first time, GM and its history had to do these massive layoffs because they had just claimed bankruptcy. And it was like, shed the weight now because this company is going down. Well, we all know the rest of the story. And the bailout came through and the company has rebound and is making its, its tracks back again in the economy. However, while I was laid off, I, I said to God, I need to know exactly what's going on here. Where am I leading? What's going on? It was weird coming home every day from school with my dad in his study, searching for jobs. It was just odd not having him out being the provider. Well, a very good friend of mine, a very good pastor friend of mine, in fact, he was our pastor at South Flint, who knew HMS Richards Jr. out of Glendale, California. And when my pastor friend was going into the ministry many years ago, he was told by HMS Richards Jr. that if you are going into the ministry, you must exhaust all possibilities. You must exhaust everything because the ministry is a 24-7 calling. And you must know that there's one door and one door only that God will open if that is the door of the ministry that you are to go into. I've always kept that in mind, and so I thought, okay, God, I'm going to test you. I need to survive. I need to provide for my family. We need to keep, we need to move on. We need to regroup. We need to do something because I was out of a job. And when I had hired into General Motors 21 years previously, I was expecting to retire from GM and, and live our life continue, continually in, in Flint, Michigan, and die and be buried in Flint. I mean, Flint was home. So I started putting out applications and resumes. And to make a long story short, I put out 399 resumes and applications. Uh, the 400th one I'll get to in just a second. And I, I would put out applications to multi-million dollar companies, uh, the Whirlpool Corporation, Volkswagen Corporation, other car companies and so forth from Maine to California. And it boiled down to a couple interviews that I had with some of the major Fortune 500 companies. And I'll talk a little bit about one of those interviews in just a second. However, I was also starting to put my feelers out among the conferences of the North American Division of Seven Day Adventists to start just putting my, my name out there to see if anybody would hire a layperson such as myself to minister, to be a minister of the gospel because that's ultimately what I was feeling called to do, but I needed to exhaust all possibilities. He got a call for Volkswagen. And it just so happened to be down in near Chattanooga, Tennessee, where there's a, a Seventh-day Adventist university, and, one, and my oldest daughter happens to uh, be very interested in attending there. In fact, she's going to be transferring there, transferring there this coming summer. And I uh, thought, wow, you know, this is perfect. If I get this job down there, then we're going to be able to move down to a heavily populated Adventist community and my wife will be able to get a job in the hospital system where we'll live happily ever after like we were with General Motors, at least so we thought. Well, I had three interviews with Volkswagen and I went down to Tennessee to have that third interview. And every time I had an interview, I have to back up, every time I would interview with a company, I always would say, God, if this is not meant for me to be, please close the door. Close the door. And so when I went for my third interview down at Volkswagen, um, it went very well. My parents were discussing Volkswagen about the interview and how he got this call. And I walk into the room and I butt into their conversation like a normal teenager would. And I'm just, it's like something, the Holy Spirit pretty much was, I mean, you could tell it was there. Like, just out of my mouth came. Wait, are you guys talking about Volkswagen again? Yes. Yes. But didn't you just get laid off from GM? Why would you want to go work for another car company? Isn't God's work more important? I just remember my dad freezing his stare on my mom. And my mom just like, like you see in the movies, they just stop and stare at each other for like a couple seconds. It was pretty intense. But after that, we got to talking. And fortunate, fortunately, actually, Volkswagen turned my dad down. 
and that started the adventure to Alaska. <laughs> that was one of our major confirmations from God that we have to uproot from our home and our friends and our family in Flint, Michigan and move 3,000 miles away and begin a full-time ministry. All in all, I knew this was the right move for our family. Throughout the whole process, not one negative thought came into my mind that this was a bad idea. There were three more things that I, that had to, that we made a request to God that had to take place if, if this was going to work for us to go to Alaska and begin a ministry. And the three things were we needed to find someone to rent our home. We needed to secure my kids' education out here, out in Alaska. And my wife needed a job because I was going into the ministry as a lay pastor. So I was going to be a stipend pastor for a while. And we can't make a living on a stipend pastor. And so my wife, who is a professional um, person in the medical field, needed to have a job. So my wife and I got down on our knees. We held hands and we, we submitted ourselves to God. And, and we completely said, God, we are at your mercy. If you want us out in Alaska to do ministry full time, these three requests that we are making of you, please make happen. Because they have, they're essential for us to live out here in Alaska. Within 24 hours, Every single request, those three requests, became fruitful. We found someone to run our home. We secured schooling for my children. And my wife received a phone call from the hospital system that she now works for out here in Ketchikan, asking her to work for them. Within 24 hours, those three requests all happen. And coming here to Ketchikan where things are smaller, the island has a very limited access because you either get here by plane or by boat. So you want to make sure that the time you spend here is quality. And the people here love to welcome people to their community, but they also have to guard their community and make sure that there isn't people coming in that are not trustworthy. And so as we've spent our time as lay minister and his wife here, it's been very interesting to lay down relationships and start to learn how to get to know the people because they come from very long laid traditions and they're very hardy people. They're independent and an example is I work as an occupational therapist doing home health and when I go to see some of my patients who are elderly in their late 80s and early 90s and I try to give them helpful hints on how to do things a little easier, they usually have the spirit of, I can do it myself. I used to carry water from the ocean and boil it and get the salt out of it, then drink it. So they have a very hearty spirit here and they're extremely willing to grow and learn new methods, but they have to trust you first. I have not ever regretted moving to Alaska. By far, this is the most amazing experience anyone could have. Here in Ketchikan, we have three Native nations represented, the Tlingit, Haida, and Simshian nations. They are very present in our culture here. You'll see totem poles and other artifacts throughout the city that show how important their cultures are and how they have shaped the city of Ketchikan. When you greet them, be sure to say a hearty hello and don't be afraid to ask for directions because they're always willing to help. And the more you engage with them, the more they're willing to engage with you. If you give them a chance to share with you a memory they have of maybe a totem pole you see down by Creek Street, or possibly you'll be out by Totem Bite and you'll be seeing some of the eagle's nests and other beautiful sights that you'll see here, they are always willing to share opportunities to educate you on their island. It's a paradise here and they love to talk about it. We get lots of liquid sunshine so don't be afraid to get a little bit wet and you won't see any Ketchikanians walking around with umbrellas because we're used to the rain. So if you want to fit in, don't wear a rain hat and don't carry an umbrella. <laughs> or if you feel that you don't have the experience enough or what have you, maybe not the seminarian degree, so to speak, that you may not have, as long as you have a willing and teachable spirit, a willing and teachable heart, God can do miracles. I'm preaching. I'm standing up in front of people. I am being stretched in ways that I never, 
ever imagined I would ever be in. I used to hate, absolutely hate, getting up in front of people. And many of you know what I'm talking about. So God has taken me, an active lay person, and, and has worked with me and taught me that it's okay to get up in front of people. It's, it's okay to preach the, the message. It doesn't have to be perfect, so to speak, but He works with you. He takes the fears away from you, and He molds you into the character and person He really wants you to be so you can do His glory and help finish the work. There is nothing more important than finishing the work that we have been assigned to do on this earth so that we can all go home. I want to go home. I know that you want to go home. Heaven is our home. I buried loved ones. I know what it's like to lose loved ones in life. And I want nothing more than to wrap my arms around them again on that resurrection morning. It's a very emotional thing for me, the second coming. And knowing that Jesus is coming again soon to take us home, I have vowed to my Lord and Savior that I am going to help finish this work as much as I can allow God to work in my, in my spirit. I want to go home. And I want people that I know and love and those I may have never met and in getting to know here in Ketchikan and wherever the Lord takes us, I want them to see our Savior on that resurrection morning. Nothing is more satisfying than when you, a lay person, bring a soul to Christ. Do you have an adventuresome spirit? Would you like to come to Alaska and be a missionary? We have 230 native villages. We're only in 10 of them. Maybe you could come and help us. Now, if you have an adventuresome spirit, we would love to have you come and join us here in Alaska. You can be a missionary in some of these front line areas where we need people to come and work. I encourage you to take a look at our website, alaskaconference.org. I want to show you some of the work that the Eskimos do. They are incredibly talented artisans and have been for a thousand years. This is the general shape of the eagle. Look at these little uh, balls. They're made from uh, polar bear fur and they have seal skin in the center and then beadwork. You put them together like this. You get one going. Let me see now. Let me get them going right here. <laughs> I'm no good at it. For my Alaska, this has been Ken Crawford. Thanks so much for coming with me. If you enjoyed watching this series, if you're interested in what you've seen or what we're doing in Alaska, go to the Alaska website, alaskaconference.org, and there you'll find additional information. <laughs>